if we're all going to die, no matter what we do, no matter how good or bad we are, no matter how many veggies we eat, whatever it is, we're all, if, or if death is not a failure and we're going there no matter how we live, well then the sort of pressure's off to get everything just so. Can you imagine if like, if the setup was, if you do everything certainly just right, you can get through a keyhole and 0.1% of us will live forever. Can you imagine the, the pressure to get that through that keyhole and get everything right? Hi, I'm David Aben, founder of The Bucket and your host for The Bucket Podcast. Today's podcast is for anyone who thinks they might die someday. I'm talking with Dr. B.J. Miller and Shoshana Berger, the authors of a really important new book called A Beginner's Guide to the End, Practical Advice for Living Life and Facing Death. B.J. Miller is a hospice and palliative care physician who has worked in many settings, inpatient, outpatient, home, and residential hospice. He sees patients and families at the University of California, San Francisco's Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center as part of the Symptom Management Service, where he's worked since 2007. BJ was also executive director for the Zen Hospice Project from 2011 to 2016. He speaks around the country and beyond on the theme of living well in the face of death. His co-author, Shoshana Berger, has worked in publishing for more than 20 years as a freelance writer, senior editor at Wired, and editor-in-chief of ReadyMade, the magazine she co-founded in 2001. She became editorial director of the global design firm IDEO in 2013, where she has worked on projects related to the end of life, modern Judaism, and school lunch. She has written for the New York Times, Wired, Travel and Leisure, Sunset, Spin, Popular Science, Marie Claire, and the San Francisco Chronicle. Today, you'll hear how and why these two came together to write this book and why they think you should read it. Welcome, BJ and Shoshana. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks for having Thanks us. Thanks for having us, David. Uh, I've been really looking forward to this because um, in my conversations with people about the bucket, um, it's like you're in another country and nobody speaks the language. Mm -hmm. And so you get people smiling and nodding like, death, mortality, like, okay. Mm -hmm. And so in talking to you guys, it's kind of like I found somebody who speaks the language. <laughs> and so that's really exciting for me. So I just want to start with the book. The book is called A Beginner's Guide to the End, Practical Advice for Living and Facing Death. And so I just want to get some background. Why did you write it? Um, mm -hmm. What are you trying to uh, have people get out of it? And uh, just tell me more about that. I'll have questions for each of you, Yeah, but uh, I don't know who wants to take this one. You want to start? Well, sure. <laughs> just just because. I mean, well, there's so much to say. I mean, there's the all how Shoshana and I came to, met, uh, to meet and get to know each other and feel the trust that, required, that this book required, which is its own kind of, um, you know, there's a lot to say about that. We kind of had experiences together here at IDEO, ran some projects and did various things together and found each other, um, found like minds and complementary minds. And, and when Shoshana asked, it was her idea to write this book, and when she asked, it was a pretty quick yes, because from where I sit as a clinician, the need for a book like this is obvious. I mean, as, as, as a, any kind of medicine, or just these days, just about anywhere in the world, you, you, you're going to get hit with this issue. And particularly in medicine, you're aware of all the mountains of suffering that happen towards the end of life that are so unnecessary. They're really a reflection of just non-thinking systems or lack of attention or just some very basic things. So anyway, so when Shosh asked, it was a very quick yes, because I knew the world needed some sort of book like this. Um, and I guess I'll just say one more thing. I mean, what I hope happens is that it's a nice level set. I think it's well titled. It's a beginner's guide. The subject's huge. There's no way we can touch on every aspect of this this right. thing. Um, and But we hope we did it some, uh, we hope we paid it a good respect. And the idea would be to sort of level set. So in, in a massive way, soup to nuts, you have kind of a smattering of all the issues that come up towards the end of life, at least here in sort of the Western society. And the hope would be that this sort of raises the floor for society. It's not going to blow off the roof. There's so many other things to get to, but hopefully it raises the floor so we'll have like a relatively good starting line together. That's the hope for me. Yeah. So obviously you probably agree with that, but what motivated you to say, let's write this book? 
Well, I think your listeners probably hear that already because BJ com- like oozes compassion out of his pores. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and you feel it the, me- the minute you're in his presence. And when I met BJ, I was three months into the death of my father. It had been a very harrowing and difficult period of five years watching him lose his mental faculties to dementia. And he had been a professor for 50 years, so he was basically a walking brain. And when he lost that, that was the one thing that mattered to him. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had come out of that experience with a lot of regret for feeling like I just didn't know how to be a good caretaker. I didn't understand how to navigate healthcare. I didn't understand what care we could expect, what help we could expect. I, I didn't understand insurance and how to talk to doctors and you know the millions of systems questions that come up when you're taking care of a loved one who's either chronically ill or dying. And so meeting BJ, we met on this fateful day. It was an IDEO kickoff for a project around the hospice that he was then director of, Zen Hospice. Mm -hmm. And the idea was, how do we get the message out about hospice, that it is not a death sentence? Hospice actually offers you the best and freest care possible in a time that's incredibly trying for your family. And yet people see it as the end of the road, right? Right. Um, And so they often don't elect it until it's far too late. So BJ walked in, we we actually built this kind of death yurt inside the (laughs) IDEO offices for us to have this conversation. It was, yeah, I mean, literally erected this kind of dome and we walked- Inside. Inside the office. Inside the office. Um, It's nuts. And, and walked through this tunnel with kind of flickering lights coming in from above and music. And, you know, essentially we were trying to create an intimate space to have this conversation. And, uh, you know, the people in the room were sharing kind of what they wanted for their last day on earth. Mm-hmm. And there were some very grand visions, you know, I want to be on an iceberg in, in Iceland. And <laughs> I, you know, I have a whole playlist, a whole music playlist, and that's going to connect me to myself. And, and I remember thinking, this doesn't resemble at all what my experience was with my father, which was sitting in our, in my sister's childhood room and scrambling around to find a tape of old Yiddish music that he might like to hear as he was dying and staying up all night beset and just stroking his head and watching him go, that was quite a different vision. And I think many people can, will resonate with what it truly is, which is a very quiet, intimate, and you know, sometimes in the hospital, it can be a very noisy experience with alarm bells going off and the ICU. So, I needed to reconcile, you know, kind of our desire for a grand experience at the end of life and for uh, something that feels like it reflects our identity and the real experience that I had just had. And BJ came in with this really incredible vision for how we could start to reframe our relationship with death um, based on his work. And so it was so clear to me in that moment, like, oh my God, people need help with this. You know, I need help with this, and there's a million people who need help with this. We should write a book that walks people through this. Yeah, what's so great about, I listened to it. Mm. And what was mm. so great about, I know that you had said at the opening that you didn't necessarily write what you read, but it was great to hear your voices, the emotion of that. Because I felt your your pain with your father mm. when you talked about it. and And it also feels like, um, you learn from each other. So I'd like to know, like, what did you learn from what BJ wrote um, that you didn't know before, and what did you learn from Shoshana? You start? Well, um, again, I'm just going to return to this notion of open-heartedness and compassion. So I come from a very hard-boiled journalistic world where you're there to entertain and enlighten and speak truth to power, right? That's a pretty hard brass tacks voice. And so that's the way I write. 
And then I would read BJ's words and it was like this flowing, philosophical, <laughs> open-hearted, um, you know, lyrical, compassionate voice. And I was, I was immediately comforted by it. And then I put that up against my like magazine voice and I was like, oh, wow, we need to find a happy medium here. So I think both of us kind of shifted to the median. Mm -hmm. um, he maybe picked up a little for me, but I certainly picked up a lot about how to make the reader how to put the reader at ease, how to give the reader the sense of space, the sense of you're with a friend now, it's okay. And, and as a journalist, I did not know how to do that. And I didn't know anything really about writing. I mean, I don't, I'm not a writer. So, you know, this would have, would have been, if we had endless time, <laughs> we would have been so interesting for each of us to write the book independently and then just cross reference because it, it would have been, my book would have been terrible. I mean, it would have just been so... I would not have ever found myself to a comfortable sort of stating something declarative. I would have always been dwelling in the exceptions to the rules. And it would have just been this... By itself, it would have just been... It would have gone into the ether as there would have been no end point for the reader. It would have just gone in <laughs> loops. Anyway, so a big piece for me was just watching and learning about the craft of writing in such a way that actually you're getting information across this in this practical way. You're not trying to write poetry, but you are trying to parlay information, but you're also trying to do it with this sort of emotional support underneath the words, because we know the reader is going to be in some amount of vulnerability with this subject, as we are. So we had to find a way to share the emotion as well as sort of the practical bits, and that's, I think, the marriage between us works so nicely. Um, and then I also just learned, so how Shosh writes, one thing, and then there's also just the content that she brought as a journalist. To the, I, I don't, I, I learned a lot about sort of the finances. I learned a lot about the insurance hell. I learned a lot about the sort of day-to-day -day vagaries of this stuff that doesn't really make its way into a clinical encounter, although it probably should. So I learned a lot from the content that she brought to the book as well. Right. When I think about uh, the reaction to the book, I'd like to find out what, what has the reaction been from people? What have you been hearing? I'm, uh, your listeners may hear my dog Maisie in the background. Um, that's not my stomach. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, most, well, interestingly, we haven't heard a lot of negative feedback. I don't know, <laughs> which is great. I'm, you know, the book, of course, is imperfect, and it's not going to do justice to every situation. I'm waiting for a real... Uh, to hear a, a hard critique, but for the most part, I think, in what we've experienced, you know, and your podcast is a good example, and what we've experienced out in the world is that there's a hunger to talk about these things, there's a desire to have some language and some safety around it. So mostly what we hear is some amount of gratitude for even trying to put right. a book out there, just for cracking the plane, you might say, you know, open it up a little bit. So for you to write this book, nobody's surprised. You're a Palliative care doctor. Right, I guess this that's is right. this is something that you do yeah, in terms right. of the a topic. But for you, Shoshana, I, because for me, when I talk to people about this is what I'm doing with a bucket, we're talking about I call it uh, mortality-based living. Um, people look at me; they they put their uh, they close their eyes, put their hands over their ears, and it's like mm -hmm. they why are you? What's wrong with you? So. <laughs> Since you didn't have this background, what's the reaction you've gotten from people? Yeah, that's a great question, because it really did come out of left field. Um, yeah, so the first reaction is, are you okay? <laughs> is there something we should know? Um, thinking that you got a diagnosis. But no, you're absolutely right. It was, a, it was out of left field for me. And, you know, the interesting thing is, is that people really, um, you know, you think that people have a certain conception of you and a certain image of you and that you have to hold to that and you kind of pigeonhole yourself in life. And I find that people, people, first of all, they're not thinking about you. They're thinking about themselves. <laughs> and second of all, they are incredibly forgiving of whatever choice you decide to make. I mean, they're just, they're like, wow, that's interesting. Tell me more about that. That's kind of cool. Um, so, you know, there were certainly some people who I couldn't have a conversation with about it. I remember walking into my accountant's office and putting the book on his desk and he visibly recoiled and pushed his chair back. <laughs> he was like, why would you write that? Um, 
And so people have different reactions, but I've found that most people want to be thought of as a person that contains multitudes and someone who is expansive and can reach all sorts of different places in life. Mm -hmm. You know, how boring would life be if we had to do one thing our whole lives? Yeah. Um, so I think people are actually like encouraged and emboldened by it. Like, wow, you had a do-it-yourself design magazine and now you're doing death. Okay, game <laughs> on. Um, so I like that part of it. So I'm sure you've encountered what I, I call the choir. So the, you're familiar with the death positivity movement. And so some of the people I talk to are in the choir. They're, you know, Kimberly Paul, she's the mm -hmm. Death by Design. She's doing the Live Well, Die Well tour going across the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Before I Die festival, festivals that go on throughout the world. And, and so when you talk to people in this choir, everybody's all in. And uh, how do we get outside the choir? Because your mm -hmm. book is to the choir in a sense. It's like the people that are going to pick that up and say, I got to read this are the people that are probably already, not necessarily the practical stuff that you talked about, but the emotional stuff, they're already kind of there. So how are you reaching outside the choir and how do you think we can? Oh, well, I'll jump in. It's, it's you're ringing up a really very important point. I mean, um, there is something lovely about the choir. It's sort of because in some ways we all feel by being interested in the subject, it is, a, first of all, something very important and intimate to have in common. So when you meet someone from this choir, it's very pretty quickly warm and lovely. Um, and that this, this choir uh, traditionally over the years has been a little bit like we've discussed, you know, at odds with the rest of life on some level or the rest of society on some level. So in some ways there's a little counterculture to it. And when counterculturists meet each other, there's a sweetness to it. And some of the talks I've ever given and some of the stuff we've done together, it really feels like you're part of like a, just sort of a, a revival, you know, that we're checking in together in groups to kind of reaffirm our interest and learn maybe a new thing or kind of remind ourselves. That's beautiful and it's important, so I don't want to discount that. But that's not really who, the, the people who really need this information or the folks who aren't necessarily looking for it or willing to pick up that book, which is, as you can imagine, is a huge design. Um, you can look at it as a design problem. That's one of the reasons why it was such an easy yes to work with Shoshana um, with her background in design, knowing that having faith that we could together and with our illustrator, Marina Luz, a woman who did beautiful work, um, we felt like we could create an object and the design brief for the book itself was that the book itself be palliative, that it have, that it be comforting even just to touch. So the, the texture of the paper, the imagery is really, really important, the way the book is spaced, etc. So the, we hope that the design principles help people be attracted to a thing that they're otherwise repelled by. So we'll see how that goes. But that was a huge piece of why a book and a mass, so for a massive scale and why why put so much energy into the design of it? That's, that's a start. We will we'll see where it goes. We're hoping that more and more people will catch on. Our faith is, and I'll just say one more thing, our faith, we wrote it really with the sensitivity of the person who is dealing with illness themselves, but right behind them and next to them, of course, is the caregiver. And our hunch is that most of the time, it's gonna be in these early days of the book, it would probably be the caregiver who picks it up. Um, but we get a lot, asked a lot, like, how do I give this to my parents? They're gonna what message will I be sending them if I give them this book? And you know, we'll just have to see how it plays out. I think there are ways to do that for your listeners. It's sort of like, well, for one, you can, you can own it. You can say, Mom, man, I've found this book very, very helpful, and it would be helpful to me if you guys read it. It would, help, it would mean something to me. You'd be doing me a favor, that kind of thing. We'll see if we can infiltrate this that way, but that's, that's the hope. I've just been talking a long time. I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> but anyway, that's our big hope, but this is an open question. This is an open question. I don't yeah, know if you I, had anything. For me, shows. part of it is the title. And I know you had a title that was even more direct. Yeah, the original title was How to Die. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, that's one of the things that uh, we're trying to do is to take away these words and language that try to hide it. Because yeah. I think the hiding and not dealing with it is one of the biggest problems. So mm -hmm. um, right. do you think that's a way to get to the choir to be so direct? 
yeah, get outside the choir. I do. And in fact, um, one thing we really were mindful of when we were writing this book is not being Pollyanna-ish about the beauty of death. I mean, because there are times when, and I believe me, I love the choir, but there are times when the death positivity movement goes so far in the direction of positivity that you forget that this is also a process that can be enormously difficult, painful, um, and involve a lot of grief. And again, this is trying to reconcile the reality with us um, working with it as an abstraction. I mean, BJ and I have never died, right? <laughs> you know, like we were beginners too. Um, and so we want to kind of take the full breath of experience in. And I just want to tell a quick story about this, which is that I just visited with a dear friend um, from college who's now dying of brain tumor, glioblastoma. And um, he, he doesn't have long left. And when I saw him, his, you know, part of him was, was paralyzed and he was having a real, tr real trouble with speech. Um, and he had come home basically in a fel farewell tour to Los Altos, uh, to his mom's home, and all of his relatives had come to basically say goodbye. I mean, nobody said it out loud, but that's what it was. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't know much about the situation. He had literally texted me, good timing for your book, I Have Brain Cancer, and can you meet me in Los Altos on this day? So that's all I knew, and I show up, and there's all the relatives there, and I, his, his mother walks me to the bathroom, and in the hallway I said, can you just tell me a little bit more about what's going on? And she broke down and she said, you know, he has a brain tumor, it's progressing, it's incurable, and um, he's going through treatment. And then she started crying, and I said, I'm, I'm just so sorry, and she said, it's unbearable. And she had been smiling and keeping a brave face on and greeting me like a host. Um, and this was not the moment when I was going to say, I have a book for you. <laughs> <laughs> we don't right. want to be opportunists right. in that moment. But um, I just was there that day. And I, you know, Mike knew about the book because he had, he was the one who had texted me. Anyway, I just got a text from his mother saying that she had gotten the book and read it and um, that it was enormously helpful to her and that it was comforting just to know that it was out there and that I was out there. And this is not someone who would have really been in the death positivity movement, nor would she have thought about these issues. And again, like she's the kind of person who I think um, probably would not have been in this conversation had she not been forced to be a part of this conversation. But it was such a moment for me of thinking, oh good, pe maybe people will just come to it if they need it. I don't have to do any work here. I don't have to give her the book. I don't have to say anything about the book. Just knowing that it's out there, maybe that's enough. And mm. that was really helpful mm. to yeah, know that's that. That's great. That's beautiful. I'm sorry, I was going to add something to that. Yeah. Like, I think it was, that's, I, I hadn't heard that story at church. It's beautiful. And it reminds me of like one of the ways along the way of work in this thing was this, this feeling of putting something out in the world that might, that, that will be there when someone needs it. It was just a lovely feeling and trusting that they'll find their way to it or vice versa. And that has felt actually really good, I think, on our end, just to put it out there. If you need, it's there with and when you need it, um, that kind of spirit. And I'll just say one more thing on this, too. I think you bring up some really important points here. And one is, amen to the death positivity movement. There's a lot to say about that. But um, I think we try to be sort of death neutral, not for or against it. I mean, if we're, if we're pro anything, we're sort of pro reality. You know, if I, I, I don't know if that's speaking for both of us, Shosh, but um, I mean, I, I would love readers who hate death and want to have nothing to do with it. I, this book is still for them, too. I mean, it, the best thing about this subject matter is its total inclusion. So it's, we really try to be sort of neutral in our tone, but really love reality if we're loving anything. Yeah, I'll bet this is a book that is passed around a lot. Mm. You know, somebody has it and you've got to find them with, you know, all the pages uh, dog-eared and mm. stuff like that with just um, people saying, this helped me. 
mm. that kind of thing. So one of the things I want to talk about is regret. Um, you've seen regret firsthand in, in with uh, the hospice, mm -hmm. and uh, it's an undercurrent. And um, I have a, a quote that I want to read. Uh, My goal in all this is to appreciate the life I have while I have it, drive it earlier in life, not hedging our bets, not deferring those important moments with people we care for and love. And you talked about in your uh, Creative Mornings video, uh, Bronnie Ware's top five regrets, and uh, is there something you're not letting yourself do? So how, how can we help people not have these deathbed regrets, if you will, and, and do they need a death sentence mm. to get there? So, do uh, you want to go first, Shell? Sure. Uh, I think it's, this is how this book and meeting BJ and being in this movement has, has helped me, is that I, I really just don't sweat the small stuff anymore. I, I just, this being engaged with this topic really helps you think about what matters and focus on what matters in life, you know? And if I have one thing that I'm really trying to do now, it's clearing the space to do that. Because of course, writing the book and going on the road and promoting it takes you away from all of that mm -hmm. stuff that matters, <laughs> like my kids and my family and just having some time. So, um, you know, that's a constant juggling act. As any working parent knows, it's, it's not always easy to focus on what matters. Sometimes you are really bogged down. And there are people who are a lot less fortunate than I, who, for whom thinking about what matters seems like a ridiculous luxury, you know? Um, I mean, they're just trying to get food on the table. So t realizing that it's a luxury to do it, I do think that knowing your time is limited it becomes more precious and you you really start to clear space for what matters how can people it seems that it's it's hard for people to do without that you know notice that time is limited yeah and can i just add one quick story because and this was in that creative mornings talk but i just love it so much because it it shows like sometimes people really need to be forced and this is the story of alfred nobel waking up one morning in Paris and reading his own death notice in the paper. And of course it was his brother who had died and they had made an error and written it for Alfred. Um, but the, the headline was, the merchant of death has died. And of course, until that day, Alfred Nobel had been known for being the inventor of dynamite. So the man who found a way to kill more people faster than anyone else has died. And basically good riddance. And he was horrified by this. Is this what he would be remembered for? And it was thought that that incident is what got him to endow the Nobel Prize and be a great benefactor and be remembered as that. And we can't ha always have that moment of reading our own obituary, but there are some really fun things to do, like actually doing the exercise of sitting down and writing about your well, life. I don't know if you know this, but we have an article about that that talks about Nobel. Do you really? Yeah, it's one Fantastic. of our articles. <laughs> telling people to write their own obituary, and we've referenced that story. I oh, love it. And uh, it is trying to get people, you know, the, I, we think of people having their heads down and um, uh, just not looking up whether they don't have time or whether they just don't want to, and uh, not doing the things they want to do. Mm -hmm. Is that something you see with the people you deal with? Oh, sure, all the time. Yeah. I mean. It is really, first of all, it's really hard to know. One of the hardest questions for me to answer is, what do I want? Mm. <laughs> like, what is important to me? You would think, and I'm with you, it is a luxurious question. I mean, that we have, there's, it's an interesting history of, of, of the history of leisure and the idea of having sort of free time for cognitive powers to roam and explore and it's a lovely notion, and it is luxurious, etc. And it's really, really hard. I, I, I really don't know what I want much of the time. In some ways, the, the what's adaptive for me is fine. I'm, I've gotten much better at finding something to like in just about anything. That's how I've adapted to my life. 
And so in some ways I've drowned out, like I, I don't really know what my gut always tells me, what I want. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, so anyway, it's a very difficult question. I'm with you. I don't know that we can or should live in there every moment of every day. And it's, it's just not necessarily practical. And even if you did, you'd have so little in common with people around you that you might feel alone. <laughs> so anyway, I would just say, I mean, absolutely regret is a big part of it. It certainly comes up in the deathbed moment. But interestingly, if I'm really, if I step back and think about the patients I've worked with and families I've worked with, it just comes up in a lot of ways around the subject. I do talk to my patients about regret. It certainly comes up. But you know what comes up pretty quickly too? Once the context of, of the preciousness of time, once the context of mortality is set, and once that abstraction is becoming real for someone, oftentimes things like forgiveness are right there too. And the impossibility of going through life without compiling some regrets. So let's be realistic, you know. And so I often see patients, yes, explore some amount of regret at some point, but also sort of let it go. I often see where the regrets get so sticky are often with the family, people who have to keep living with those regrets. I see that in myself. This book, and one of the effects, the side effects of this book for me is it, it ginned up my regret wheel. I, I, I was, I still am shocked how much time on any, any day I spend thinking about regret. Not in an abstraction or intellectual way, like my own regrets. It's really ramped up that engine for me. So I'm working through stuff. So I guess a long-winded way of saying regret's normal, you know, uh, it's forgivable. It actually is also like a lot of the reframing we do in the book, it's a sign like you regret something because you love life so much you're trying to fit a lot into mm -hmm. it. You know, that, so seeing love as the source of your regret, I think, is a very helpful tool. Um, and then the last thing, gosh, sorry, I should... No, that's, but, that's um, why I'm here. Well, good. The last thing, I think, also why there's something to be said, never mind the practical counsel, etc., but just getting each other, helping each other fit the idea of death into our daily view of reality because that's where all the trouble lies. If it's just this foreign thing that's outside of normal life, if it's this anomaly, this foreign invader, well, then we're going to be at war with death and et cetera, et cetera. But if we can rope it into our sort of daily purview, de discharge it a little bit, lower the charge around a little bit. Once you tune into that, death is just everywhere. And like Shosh mentioned earlier, death has a lot of cousins, like loss of any kind. From my experience, personally, I, I, if I'm just observing, I love thinking about this, I've shed just about as many tears for lost car keys and wallets as I have lost <laughs> limbs. Like there's weird, strangely, loss on some of it is loss, and ends are ends, and death is death, and you walk down the street and it's just everywhere. So I think part of the work, and meditation does this, I think that's another reason why meditation is finding its way in our world these days, is a way to sort of stay present with all that actually is, and all that actually is includes a heck of a a lot of loss, regret, death, etc. Yeah, one thing, uh, one notion that BJ brings up, which I just love, is the idea of actually practicing loss, mm -hmm. like actually making it a daily practice. Oh, I, you know, I missed the bus. I'm gonna take a walk instead. I'm gonna walk and see what happens, and just kind of just allowing that to happen. I am losing shit all the time, <laughs> and yeah, there's a moment of grief and anger and all that, and then you just kind of like get through it and you accept it and that 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 daily practice i think you talk about that helping mm. you get ready for the big loss yeah which i think is really profound yeah i think grieving is a skill i think loss is a skill yeah that's really fascinating with you know helping people do this there are a lot of obstacles now you've had some very real obstacles in your life and for our listeners if you don't know bj has a story to tell that you can go and watch the TED Talk, which nine and a half million people have seen, mm -hmm. um, and get the whole story. But if you could just give us two minutes of, of your story and the obstacles you've faced. Sure. I mean, yeah, there have been many, <laughs> like we're saying. But the, the big one, the one that, took, that made me take sort of notice and take stock in my life in a different way was, the, uh, was when I was a sophomore in college. And uh, it was in November, and I was horsing around with some friends one night, and we just decided to climb a parked train, a commuter train in New Jersey, with the wires running overhead. And it wasn't really, you know, it was just sitting there. It was not, we, did, we had done a lot, we had done some much more, we thought much more foolish things. We were just climbing like a tree. Um, 
but I had a metal watch on him. When I stood up on top of the train, I was close enough to the power source and the electricity arc to the watch. And so in a millisecond, you know, entered, electricity entered the arm and then blew out the legs. So it was all instantaneous, you know, practically. And then that landed me in the hospital for many months with a series of amputations. I lost both legs below the knee and my left arm below the elbow and came close enough to death to smell its reality, to actually really viscerally get it on some level. Um, I still haven't died, but parts of me have, but I think any of us can say that. Um, so anyway, so that was sort of the big, the big one, the big event. But like I say, I, want to, I do want to get across to our listeners, like uh, one of the things you learn in, in clinical medicine and palliative care is you know, the, the treachery of comparing sufferings, like who suffers more, like whose suffering is cooler or bigger or whatever else. <laughs> I wouldn't go down that path. The truth is we all have some access point to it. Mine's just been pretty darn obvious and dramatic. And I think the physical obstacles are, I think, sometimes easier. Mm. I can't speak oh, totally. for you, and I don't mean oh, I to, agree. but that, that the, like if I have a problem with my knee, I go get a knee replacement. Mm -hmm. I go, I get, I get something done. If I have a problem that's keeping me from doing what I've really wanted to do, it's in here. Mm -hmm. And I, how do you get over that? How do you overcome those obstacles where I can get out of the rut that you can mm. be in saying, I can't do that. Mm. And you know, one of the things we want the bucket to be is not a philosophy, mm. but a how-to. A mm -hmm. lot of our articles are, this is how you do that. This is how you house swap so that mm -hmm. you can do go to France even though you don't have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And so getting over these mental, mental obstacles about, oh, I can't do that. I, mm -hmm. like, um, how do people do that? Like, mm. What's the trick? Well, I, I'll, I'll keep talking. We can jump in and build on <laughs> here, Shosh. But I mean, wh one thing to say is, like Shosh was mentioning, the sort of practice of loss is really the practice of ad adapting. So maybe you missed the bus. Well, then you got to rethink. You know, the day's not going like you imagined. You got to regroup, rethink, find a new way. And if you kind of embrace that, well, maybe on that walk you see something you've never seen before, and you know, all sorts of things open up that you wouldn't have guessed. So one piece of advice is just. Don't be so certain of your vision for the future. First of all, you're likely to be disappointed. And more importantly, you'll miss out on all these very adaptive, creative moments where you, you shape shift to, to meet the scene that you're in front of. You know, you, 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 we are very malleable. And, um, it's amazing. It's amazing again, sorry. Uh, and part of this is, so the practice of being changed. Like one of the things I'm very proud of in my own life is that I'm still soft and mushy and effective, uh, affectable. Like I'll get really worried if I'm not, like that to me is life. Like I, I can be moved, I can be changed. And so embracing that and rolling with that and not and having an identity that is um, agile like that versus the, the contrast is, and I meet a lot of folks who have, they love conviction. I am this, I am not that. And I, I respect that, but I also know, I kind of want to be around in that day where they can no longer be that thing that they're so convinced of. And the fact is, we humans are extremely adaptive critters if we let ourselves be. So that's, there's some thoughts for you, but I think in, in general, I think one of the things that where the design world is so useful is we humans, if you can boil down our, our, the ability for us to make perspective, the ability for us to, we can't change so much of what we see, but we can change how we see it. We can change the lens, we can change the frame, we can change the context, and all of a sudden, that dynamic opens up whole other worlds of possibilities. Um, and then I guess the so last point, golly, so the last point really, as you're pointing to, I think if I heard you correctly, is one of the things that gets in our way is fear. And I was much more, I used to be a much, before my injuries, I was much more affected by fear than I am since my injuries. And in a way, it was sort of like I got to see a, a version of a mountaintop and know that I could get through it and know that my fears, that I could live with fear and I could work with it. Like that was one of the great gifts of these injuries. I think I could have always done that, but the injury, the experience of going through that proved it to me. And so fear became less, less frightening. And this is a really good frame for mortality. So if we're all going to die, no matter what we do, no matter how good or bad we are, no matter how many veggies we eat, whatever it is, we're all, or if death is not a failure and we're going there no matter how we live, well then the sort of pressure's off to get everything just so.
Can you imagine if like, if the setup was, if you do everything certainly just right, you can get through a keyhole and 0.1% of us will live forever. Can you imagine the, the pressure to get that through that keyhole and get everything right? Well, one of the gifts of death is, no, you're not gonna fail at death. And so meanwhile, failure loses its punch. You know, you can try things and fail at them and you'll still be around until you're not. So that has, so in this way, death can be a very liberating, or reconciling, reckoning with death can be a very liberating beast. That was beautiful. I have nothing to add. <laughs> yeah, that was. <laughs> I know, that was amazing. Hmm. Um, so uh, one of the things uh, we have at the bucket is something called the bucket age. So your bucket age is your statistical life expectancy uh, minus your current age. So I'm, my statistical life expectancy is about, I'll say 85, I'm 61, so my bucket age is 24. And so we're using this as trying to get people to say, okay, this is statistically how much time I have left, how am I gonna use it? And use it as a catalyst to get people to count down instead of up. Uh, what's your bucket age? Hmm. <laughs> so I'm 48. So what? So if I figure what? If I live to be, my guess would be what? You said 85 for yourself? It's probably a little high, but I just use that because it's easier to subtract from 85. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, so if I'm sticking with your convention, for some reason I think I'll die in my 70s. I don't know why. But let's just say, let's just say 85. So I'm what? Thir I've, got, I've got 37 years to go. And I like that construct. It's sort of forward thinking uh, in a very important way. I think it brings up a really nice frame of here's what time I have left to go do some stuff, to be some things, to have some thoughts, to have some feelings. So I've got 37 years to go. Um, one thing I'm pretty sure of uh, is I'm not gonna keep doing the work we're doing now. I love this subject, but I can also feel myself, I mean, I'm, in my work in hospice and palliative care, I don't think I'll do this work forever. There's just way more to life. And so one thing that I'm kind of clear on is I'm looking already to think about retiring and what would I do from this work? Where would I go from here? Mm -hmm. So that's one, a, a thought. Yeah. And you're, you've had more time to do the math. Yeah, well, I, and, I, and I am older than BJ by she a couple a years. Birthday, by yeah, the way. I just had the big Happy birthday. birthday. Oh. oh, it was the big one? A 50. Oh, I thought it was 49. Oh, oh no. sweetheart. Oh, oh no. <laughs> Extra happy birthday. Yeah, and. Um, you can edit this out if you don't like swearing, but I, from every, all of my 50-something friends have said, welcome to the give no fucks 50s. <laughs> because this is your time. Um, everyone said, you know, the 40s can be full of a lot of suffering, you have young kids, blah, blah. But the 50s, this is when you can kind of start really enjoying it. And I actually am really looking forward to it. I'm also looking forward to... <sighs> Um, feeling just kind of more fiercely like myself, you know, I think there's a lot of um, a lot of identity making in the first third to half of life and um, I think there's a settling that happens now and so I feel like the bucket age is a really interesting construct and I would like to think of it as dog years that 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 bucket age because you can do a lot more living actually when you've settled some of the basic identity stuff you know even if you don't know exactly what you want and you can't always trust your gut you probably aren't focused on a lot of the little dumb stuff that we're focused on as younger people all of the like insecurity and moments of shame throughout our day you know what did i do wrong to that person and all, constantly checking yourself I find that um, that stuff really quiets down as you get older. And I like spending time with older people much more than I like spending time with younger people. <laughs> I, I love young people too, but like the wisdom I get from people in their 70s and 80s and the sense of that they're just kind of rooted in the earth is, is quite different. Um, and so I think these bucket years are going to be the most exciting, the most um, productive, and also the most engaged with the reality of our mortality, right? Because you start losing stuff. You start losing physical capacity. You start losing energy. You start losing lots of things. So in a way, that gets you even more engaged with what matters. Yeah, it's the quality. You know, one of the things that... Um with that death positivity, 
Um, there's been a lot of books written, uh, like uh, Tul Gawande's book, Being Mortal, um, uh, Frank Ostaseski's Ostasez mm -hmm. book, The Five Invitations, um, When Breath Becomes Air, uh, Katie Butler's new book, mm -hmm. The Art of Dying Well. Mm -hmm. Do you see the currency changing in mm. terms of it's not, even though this is it's so kind of a paradox because we're living longer, but is the currency becoming quality, not quantity? Hmm. Well, um, I wish I could say yes, but I still think this culture is really mired in the idea of quantity and abundance. And, you know, it's too bad because all the research suggests that like after a certain point, the more money you make, the less happy you are. Um, all of those like um, all of the kind of intuitive things we think about getting rich or having more are, are the inverse is true that actually sometimes when you have more you're you're more miserable um, and that certainly can be true about the end of life too you know sometimes we, we extend life beyond our ability to really have it be a meaningful and 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 good life I certainly saw that happen to my father and so I think we have a lot of work to do. Um, I think the conversation has started and those books have laid the groundwork and we do feel like younger people especially are open to this conversation in a way that generations past haven't been, which is really interesting because if you think about it, a hundred years ago, people were dying all over the place, right? You know, I mean, we didn't have the medicines or technology we have now. Um, and so, and you know, you were maybe on the farm, animals were dying, grandma died upstairs, like you had firsthand knowledge of death, it was in your face. And maybe that alleviated the need for the conversation. Now that we have outsourced death, that we have cordoned it off, we send our elderly to homes, we, you know, many of us die um, in a clinical setting rather than at home, even though we often desire to die at home. Um, so, so in a way, we don't have any experience with it, and the conversation is so much more important now. And we've, BJ and I have had this experience of having these 20-somethings get up to the microphone and ask us questions, mm -hmm. saying, you know, I really want to start thinking about this now. What can I do as a 20-something? You know, what can I do in my 30s? You know, asking all of, the, all of those life cycle moments. What can I do to prepare myself for this experience? So we've been really heartened by that. Mm -hmm. It was true. It was also true at Zen back when Zen Hospice. Well, Zen Hospice Project still exists uh, for your listeners. It's important to know that. But the house had to close. Anyway, when I was there, we were surprised but extremely heartened to see that more and more people in their 20s were coming to volunteer at the hospice house. It was an amazing realization. But so I, picking up on what Shosh is saying, I, I, I see it as the context, yes, qual, qual, uh, quality, the relationship between quantity and quality is, is part of what's happening here. But I think the bigger context that I'm feeling that cuts across this issues and others is how, our, our human's relationship with, with nature. That seems to me like the, where there's the big reckoning happening. And this, the model of man versus nature, all the literature that we all grew up with in high school, English high school class, and that has all shifted. We have a different relationship to nature now, and we have to kind of reacquaint ourselves with nature. And in fact, we're more and more aware of sort of the model of acquisition, just get more stuff, and that, that way you'll buffer yourself from pain, and et cetera. That is showing itself to be a pretty bankrupt pursuit. Where are we going to put all this stuff? You know, like we have this very practical questions happening around our, our climate, around waste, etc. I see. So I see our, this the conversation we're having is part and parcel of this revisiting our relationship to nature. In some ways, reacquainting ourselves with it, but also having to find a new dynamic with nature because we've tinkered with it so much. So that I'm hopeful that that's what's happening. 
there's a clock ticking on all this too. So the books that you mentioned give me uh, great hope. The fact that your podcast exists, the fact that people are actually buying this book, that a publisher wanted to publish it, etc. All these signs are very hopeful to me, but we do have a ways to go. So you guys walking the walk mm -hmm. in terms of, you were talking before about the regrets. Like, mm -hmm. uh, are you, what are you doing to make sure you don't have any or as few as possible? Well, I'm trying to like, I hadn't realized there was like a, a cache, a stockpile in me of regrets that I hadn't really, <laughs> really been aware of. I thought I had kind of metabolized them and the book kind of ginned them up. Um, so I'm kind of working through them for me. You know we want to hear about those regrets. <laughs> yeah, well, this may be with a bottle of wine involved. I'll bring some of them. But, um, you know, for me, like, what are the lessons? What is, my, what is my viscera trying to teach me by pulling up all this old stuff? What am I missing? What am I supposed to be learning? So I'm hot in the middle of that question. I don't really have an answer right now. A lot of these regrets are kind of on the would seem kind of silly, but yet they're plaguing me. I'm just sort of having these ruminations. So something going on in me, I gotta, I gotta figure out. So I'm in the midst of that. Um, so I consider that walking the talk. You know, like the idea here is not to get so at peace that we have no problems and no hard feelings or whatever. That's not Shoshin Mai's goal here. Like we're trying to make space for all the feelings, right. including the regret, including the shame. Mm -hmm. so, so walking the talk here is making space in myself for my own gnarly thoughts and hoping to sort of metabolize them and learn from them, but I'm in the midst of that. And on another note, I'll say too, like, you know, I'm in the middle of redoing my estate plan. I had done it before, and thanks to the When I Die file, now I'm redoing it uh, finally, it's overdue. But I've still got a lot to do to populate my When I Die file. I'm, I've got a little ways to go. But for me, most of the walking the talk is not is, has things to do with not shaming myself or others, has something to do with loving, has something to do with forgiving. That's where I think the meat is for me, and I'm really trying to, that's where I'm trying to be. Yeah. And you? That's, that's amazing. And just building on that, I'd say if I've learned anything from this book, it's about just showing up and being there. That you don't have to do much in life. All people really want from you is for you to show up and be there and listen. And I was a fixer. I've been a fixer my whole life. You know, I come from a really bad divorced family and, you know, my, my father suffered with depression and like there was a lot of stuff to fix. And so I grew up real fast and started fixing as quickly as possible. And there's some value in that. Um, it makes you a very capable person in life, but there's also kind of the myth that you can f really fix anything or anyone. And so for me, accepting that and just being there and showing up has been a real lesson for me. And it's helped me to feel less regret because I kind of realize that it's not necessarily my job to fix everything. Because if you attach to that, I can fix it. I've got to be the one to save this. Um, that naturally leads to regret because you can't. Right. So just accepting that has been a big lesson for me. That's great. Um, I have a bonus question. The reason I call it a bonus question is because I don't even know what the question is. Like I, <laughs> I've been, I've been, if, if I could have figured it out, it would have been on here. Um, but I, I just want to kind of talk it out and see if you guys can understand it. Um, the whole concept of palliative care is the, the, you know, it's kind of taking away pain. It's kind of making you more comfortable to enjoy. And I'm trying to, like I said, I don't have a question. I'm not sure how to do it. But the idea of accepting mortality, accepting you're going to die, is in a way palliative. Mm -hmm. And it's like saying, okay, now I can be comfortable and I can enjoy this. Mm -hmm. And does that resonate with you? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Like, I think so. I mean, I think if I heard you correctly, what you're pointing to is this idea of however you get there, one when, whenever you can manage it, but letting, letting death be part of your sense of reality, letting yourself get to even some level of acceptance. And let's be clear, acceptance is not necessarily a great big hug. Acceptance is sort of noting something for what it is. You know, you can accept 
your cancer and still fight it tooth and nail. I mean, there's something about, I think accepting is just recognizing something. It's like noting something's sovereignty. It's like just the honor of recognizing it, seeing it. You don't have to love it. You, know, you can right. roll around in the dirt with it. In fact, many of us do. So, um, but I, and I do think by in so doing, the effect is palliative, that you will find yourself more at peace with your own nature, with the world around you, um, with all that you can't get to, and all the ways people have failed you. So I do think there is a palli there's, a, there's a palliative moment waiting for us in that acceptance, um, as long as we have a very big idea of what acceptance can look like. Um, and I think palliative care is about, I mean, the word means, palliate means to ease. And, and much of our work really is about pain management or symptom management, trying to help people feel more comfortable. But really, that's sort of that's that's just the first first part of it. The idea, the, the reason that, that we're interested in comfort is to turn down that white noise of pain or nausea or whatever else it is to make more room to have interesting conversations around meaning and around love and other things. The end is not comfort. The end, is, the, the end goal is not comfort per se, the end goal is space to have a full and rich life that will include pain, that will include suffering, that will include all sorts of things that you cannot fix. Well good, I'm, I'm glad that it makes some sense. Yeah, I think, I think there's something in <laughs> there's there, something yeah. There. Uh, how can people get the book, I assume, on Amazon and uh, all yeah, the usual all, places? All, your favorite bookseller, yeah. Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, independent bookstores, we love you, um, Amazon of course. And yeah, we are. We have a couple mm. of places where people are kind of congregating around the book and its content. We have a Facebook group, we have an Instagram page, um, and yeah, there, it's really there's a lovely little community that's gathering around the book now and having little fireside chats around that's great. some of its contents, which is great. Can I throw one more thing in there too? Yeah. A request, whether it's like writing a review or reaching out to us via, we have a website for the book, it's just the acronym, uh, a beginner's got to the end, A-B-G-T-T-E dot org, right? Dot com. Dot com, sorry. A-B-G-T-T-E dot com, a beginner's got to the end dot com. Um, we would love feedback, because hopefully if this book sells well enough, we'll have a chance for that a second edition. And, and yeah. like we say, Lord knows, there's all sorts of things that we could improve upon, so feedback very, very much welcome too. Well, uh, do you have any questions for me? I do have a question. Are you feeling, by doing your podcast, by doing the bucket, are you, is it more about sort of getting the word out about how things that you're learning and feeling and thinking, or are you actively being changed as you go through, the, as you do the, the, um, the work? It's more about spreading the word, but I've been, I've been surprised because I already believe this. Yeah. I already, you know, my big... Uh, analogy or metaphor, I'm not sure which it, what it is, is the, is the, the zoo metaphor. Mm. I don't know if you read my, my interview. I need to. It's, uh, it it's the article titled, uh, My Doctor Told Me I Only Have 25 Years to Live. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, you take the family to the zoo and you want to go see all these things, the reptiles, the, the apes, mm -hmm. and uh, you want to go to the gift shop. Um, but you never look to see what time the zoo is going to close. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then at two o'clock the zoo closes. You say, "Wait, wait a second! Mm -hmm. I wanted to do that." And then it's like I got robbed. It's like, well, no, actually, <laughs> you didn't look up. You yeah. didn't check. And so I've had that belief for a long time. But what has happened in this process is, first of all, it's finding the other people who believe in the the positive outcomes of embracing mortality and embracing that. And as I was saying to you before about con its branding, mm -hmm. death has, is the worst brand in the world. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And so um, <laughs> what are the benefits of mm -hmm. death on mortality? I've gotten to this point where just about everything I do goes through that filter of I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. And what decision should I make? knowing that it's just this filter that's always there for me now mm. and uh i find you know i've read all those books i i mentioned mm -hmm. and I, i've just amazed at the peace that i get just reading about it mm -hmm. and it's like obviously i had a, this idea for the bucket so i'm in the choir mm -hmm. but uh it's just it's not as scary 
Every mm. book, after every book, it just becomes less scary. Mm -hmm. That's and amazing. And more of, you know, okay, I got to do stuff yeah. and uh, not really worry about um, the failing. You know, I was just yeah. at this really interesting um, tech festival in Copenhagen, actually, and I was part of something called an ending summit. So I was the life part, but they also talked about the end of climate and environment as we know it, and the end of consumer products and experiences and how the moment of grief that happens there and how that process goes. And it just struck me that with every ending, a window opens. You know, with every ending, something new is, there's a beginning. Yeah. You know, there's that lovely T.S. Eliot poem in Our Beginning is Our End. And that if you can just like bathe in that um, cyclical nature of life, you know, we see it in, in spring and winter with the trees losing their leaves and then renewing in spring. This is the way that the universe works. And rather than being so afraid of it, just kind of inviting it. Yeah. It's really it's, exciting. It's missing the bus. Yeah. Yeah. I invite you all to miss your bus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening. I hope you got as much out of this as I did. I love that idea of missing the bus. For more about how to get the most out of your life by embracing your own mortality, go to thebucket.com. That's the bucket, all one word, dot com. And if you know someone you think should be on a future Bucket podcast, let us know at bucketfeedback at thebucket.com.